Jesus predicts Peter's denial. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answers, today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Gethsemane. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground. What's wrong? Thanks. He, uh, and going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus arrested. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, as we consider your words in this passage, as we behold Jesus, the one who would drink the cup of wrath for sinners, who went to the cross, Father, may we fall down in worship before him, the willing sacrifice who went to the cross to save sinners. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Amen. Get to start with a big question. I wonder what you think humanity's greatest need is. What would you have at the top of that triangle if you were making a kind of pyramid? Would it be peace, an end to world hunger? Would it be everyone to be able to live comfortably, an end to suffering, perhaps? What if we bring it a bit closer to home? What is my greatest need? 
Is it comfort tomorrow? New job? Is it a, a restored relationship with someone like a family member? Is it just to be myself as such? What would you put upon the top of your pyramid, the greatest need, the one above all else? And then may I ask you, what do you think Jesus thought was our most important need? As we've looked at Mark, we might have some options. Jesus healed many. So maybe Jesus does think our greatest need is to be healed, to be cured of all illness. He fed lots of people too. So maybe Jesus thinks our greatest need is food, an end to hunger. He was a rabbi. He taught. Maybe our greatest need is education, to learn more. And he also calmed a storm. This is a bit more tongue-in-cheek. So maybe he thought our greatest need was just calm weather and nice weather every day. But any suggestion we have hits a big problem. And that big problem is his death. Surely, if Jesus thought healing was our greatest need, he could have just carried on healing people. Uh, he, was just, he was God's son, right? He didn't have to die. He could have just walked around for a year and year and year healing people. Yes, um, travel would have been a bit slower 2,000 years ago, but he could walk on water. So he would get there in the end, right? He'd get to every, all the known world and heal people. Uh, he fed thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. So surely Jesus could just kind of feed more people, end world hunger, just say thank you for the food he has in his hand and distribute it to thousands. Maybe he could have brought peace as the Son of God commanding, uh, commanding peace. But in the end, his life, you may think, is a tragedy. He died young. Well, he died young for our time anyway, um, early 30s, perhaps not much older than me. And if he was the Son of God, surely he could have just made things so that it didn't have to happen. He could have planned events differently. So why is it? Why did Jesus die? Why did he die on a cross? Why did he walk this path willingly? Well, it's because Jesus knew at the top of our, our triangle, of the greatest need of every human being, is a restored relationship with God. And while the other needs may be important, I'm not denying that, at the top, the number one priority, need of humanity, is a right relationship with God. And Jesus shows us that. So, uh, let us come to our passage. And I'm just going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is look at the disciples and see how we see in their failing and their weakness that they move out of the way of our story, of, our, of this account of Jesus' life. And our focus is entirely on Jesus, uh, the one who bore the wrath for us, the sin-bearing substitute. So as we read this account, as we start in verse 27, we see, again, the disciples just, just don't get it, do they? They're not, they're not quite on page, on point in some respect, verse 27 to 28, another account of Jesus telling his disciples what's going to happen to him. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That passage from Zechariah picks up on the idea of God cleansing his people from their sins and creating a new people. And Jesus is clearly identifying himself as the shepherd that will be struck to bring this about. And he tells them in, his, in the fact the one who knew everything, who was in control, that they will be scattered. And he tells them too, he will rise again very clearly. Verse 28, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. But Peter doesn't really seem to hear any of that and is determined that he will be the one uh, that stands firm. He declares, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Peter just doesn't seem to get it. He's more concerned about uh, you know, proving himself to be right, to be okay, that he can do it. Uh, but ultimately, this is fulfilled. He does deny Jesus. 
And once again, we see Jesus as the one who is in total control with his plan and his mission that will be fulfilled. Peter, as of yet, fails to see that. And then we see that the rest of his disciples are also uh, unable to uh, follow Jesus in obedience. They're, they're weak, ultimately. Uh, we'll come to Jesus in the moment in this incredible uh, scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. But look with me at what happens to the disciples. Uh, they're called to watch and pray. But look at verse 37. Then when Jesus has gone, he goes off and prays. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then it happens again, verse 40. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. And finally, a third time, returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? See, Jesus' disciples in the end couldn't walk this path with Jesus. They couldn't be there with him because ultimately this was a path that Jesus had to walk alone. And the disciples needed Jesus to walk this path. Even them, the closest followers of Jesus who'd been with him the whole time, even they could not save themselves. They could not live in obedience to Jesus. They needed Jesus to accomplish his mission, to die so that they too might be forgiven. And so in some respects, as we're in this scene, it's as if the camera is trying to draw away all the, all the others. As if we need to kind of move the disciples to the background. While they've been sort of really involved in Mark's Gospels, they are moving away, moving, fading out, exiting stage left and stage right. And really what's happening now is the focus is zooming in right onto Jesus. Jesus, the sin-bearing substitute. That is what we'll see as we dig in to this section, this moment in Gethsemane, this powerful moment where we see what Jesus' death was accomplished. We zoom in to him. He is the one that must walk this path alone. For it's only him and him alone who can bear the sins of his people so they might be forgiven. Let me read to you verse 34 to 36. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. As we read these, passage, these verses, we, we feel the humanity of Jesus, the fully human, fully God. Jesus, we, we hear him express the weight of what is going to happen to him in vivid emotional language. We cannot miss that what he is about to go through is horrific. It is clear to us in how Jesus is praying. He knows what he's about to face. But for us as readers, we must ask the question, why is this going to be so horrific? Why is Jesus' death going to be this painful, this horrible? And the clue comes in verse 36, where he says, take this cup from me. Now, if we're honest, that is a slightly odd thing to say when you're about to go to die and be crucified. And it's also a striking thing to say. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't pick up on the pain or manner of death he will die. Crucifixion, historically, is known to be one of the most agonizing forms of execution available. One of the most brutal ways of killing someone humanity has invented. Romans wouldn't even execute their own citizens in this way, as if your right as a citizen uh, preserved you from such a horrendous death. It was for the lowest of the low, the criminals. Or as Roman generals would like to do as they walked back into Rome, victorious, they would line the streets with defeated soldiers, crucified. 
so that those defeated soldiers, the worst of the criminals, would suffer the agonizing, slow and painful death of hanging on a cross. But Jesus doesn't mention that at all. Indeed, the Gospels themselves seem to make very little of the physical manner of execution of the cross as such, although we know it's horrendous. But Jesus wants us to fix and zoom in on this cup that he longs from the Father to take from him. Why this cup? Why this? Well, to find out, let's turn back in our Bibles to page 740 and Isaiah 51, verses 17 to 23. Uh, please turn there. Please keep your hand in mark. That'd be really helpful. I'll give you a moment. Do flip back with me to page 740, Isaiah 51, verses 17 to 23. And let me read that to us. Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, the cup of his wrath. You who have drained from it to its dregs the goblet that makes people stagger. Among all the children she bore, there is none to guide her. Among all the children she brought up, there was none to take her by the hand. These double calamities have come upon you. Who can comfort you? Ruin and destruction, famine and sword. Who can console you? Your children have fainted. They lie at every street corner. Like an antelope caught in a net, they are filled with the wrath of the Lord, with the rebuke of your God. Therefore hear this, you afflicted one, made drunk but not with wine. This is what your sovereign Lord says. Your God who defends his people, see I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. I will put it into the hands of your tormentors who said to you, fall prostrate that we may walk on you. And you, and you made your back like the ground, like a street to be walked on. What is the cup that Jesus will drink? What is the cup he is willing to drink? It is the cup of God's wrath. Now God's wrath is his just, settled, controlled hostility to sin. His opposition to our rebellion against him. And Jesus makes very clear the severity of this rebellion and the subsequent consequences. Because Jesus speaks very clearly, as we've heard in Mark's Gospel, of two places after death, heaven and hell. Two options, two destinations, two places, real places. Now, immediately, we may want to dismiss Jesus' words, but the problem is, when, as Jesus says them, we have, as far as I can see, one of the most, the love, most loving person that ever walked, the one who is perfectly good. Now, if he said these words to trick us, then he's clearly not good. So we have to come to this conclusion. Either we just ignore the words of Jesus, or we face the reality that he portrays. The reality that either we face God's wrath and judgment or we find our hope, peace and security in Jesus. Because when Jesus died on the cross, having been abandoned by his disciples, so he experiences being forsaken by his Father as he drinks the cup. He drinks it willingly Verse 36, yet not what I will, but what you will. Rejected by all, because of his love, even though it would cause him the most painful anguish imaginable beyond anything we can imagine. Jesus, the innocent one, dies in our place. Bears the wrath so that in him we might be forgiven. This is the cup that Jesus will drink. This is what he willingly did for sinners. It is a striking picture of love. 
He does it with no one around him. All have, all have fallen away. He's alone. He must walk this path alone because only him that can do it. It is a striking love. And in 1 John 4.10 it says this. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We did not deserve it, but Jesus came to pay the price, to bear the punishment, to drink the cup of God's wrath so that we might be forgiven. So that we may not face the judgment for sin. Because someone took it for us. And it's remarkable that this love of Jesus feels so unlike the human love we're used to. We can love each other well, but I don't know about you, but a lot of the time we experience human love as the tit for tat, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Where relationships can feel fragile. One mistake and it's ended. But here we see that while we were still enemies, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was abandoned by his disciples. No one was there with him. The crowd shouted crucified. The disciples denied him. Pilate crucified him. The soldiers mocked him. No one was there. And if we think through some bizarre reason, if we were there, we would have done any different. We have completely missed how sinful we are. And we would have found ourselves in any one of those positions. But even so, Jesus says, yet not what I will, but what you will. He will walk the path. He will go through the sham of a trial we'll read about. He will willingly walk to the cross. To die an excruciating death, physically, yes, but unbearably, as he bears the wrath of God for us. See, if we've understood anything of our time in Mark's gospel over the last long time, about till January, if we've under understood anything of Mark's gospel, we must see that we are more sinful than we ever thought, but more loved than we've ever known. And so my question is, what do we do? The sin-bearing substitute Jesus, what do we do? Well, we need to hear the words of Jesus himself at the beginning of Mark. For he says, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is it. Our, our greatest need is a restored relationship. And we're told how we receive that relationship. We repent and turn back, back to, back to God. We find forgiveness in Jesus. We believe in the Son who died to save us. The top of that pyramid, the top of all our pyramids, is the question of our right relationship with the Father. Will we face the judgment of sin ourselves and experience the wrath of God? Will we in Christ find the sin-bearing substitute who died in our place, who drank the cup so that we might be forgiven? And what does it mean to repent? Repentance is merely to turn the other way, to turn away from the life of sin, to say sorry and turn back to God. It is not a high bar you need to climb. It's a low bar you need to crawl under. Perhaps that's why it's so hard, because we must admit, confess, acknowledge we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And our only way of salvation is on our knees, in confession, in sorrow, as we turn to Jesus. Today, if you are not in a right relationship with your Father, time is short. We do not know what tomorrow will bring. Turn to him. The offer is there. Jesus says you can, you can be a disciple. Confess our sins. Acknowledge him as Lord and King. Rejoice in the forgiveness you, have received, you, you can receive in him and turn in faith. That offer's there today. So maybe it's time to make that decision today. But what if you do know Jesus? What if you, uh, you know this truth? You, indeed, you're rejoicing in this truth. I hope you remember and always remember you are deeply loved 
that you have a hope and a peace, that your greatest need has been met, that you're in a right relationship with your Father. Have confidence, assurance, that history doesn't change. One of those great issues we have when we say something, we can't take it back. History doesn't change. Jesus really lived. He really walked this earth. He really drank this cup as he died. And he really rose again. The great news for us, if we know Jesus, is we can be confident we are right with our Father. We can be confident we are loved by our Father. We heard in our all-age slot that we will experience many emotions this life, many ups and downs. Rightly, we will need to acknowledge and, and work through those. But I want to t- say this morning that the question, does God love me, can always be answered yes. Even if the clouds of this life seem to obscure that for a moment, the answer is yes. Because Jesus drank the cup. He obeyed the Father. He went to the cross. You have been unimaginably loved because Jesus willingly went to die for us so that we can be forgiven. And so that question, in the midst of everything going on, in the midst of everything we may walk through, we can have absolute confidence. Does God love me? Yes. Because Jesus died to save me. We have peace. We have hope. We know we are loved. Because we see Jesus here in all his anguish. Get up from his knees. And walk the path to the cross. Bearing the punishment. The sin bearing substitute died. So that we might be forgiven. Let me pray. Father God, uh, what love is this, that you sent your son, Jesus, into the world. That although uh, we were your enemies, Jesus came to die to save us. That in Christ there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who have trusted in him. That even in the anguish of this garden, he drank that cup willingly as he went to the cross to die. Abandoned by all, he still went. That the price is paid, the wrath has been satisfied. The punishment for our sins was laid on him so that we might be free and forgiven. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not repented and trusted in Jesus, that you would help them to see their sin and then see the love of Jesus. That they may turn to him and trust in him. And I pray, Lord, for all of us that know Jesus, know this love, that we would hold fast, that even in the darkest times or even in the greatest joys, we will know so deeply and so wonderfully that we are loved, that we have hope, that we have a restored relationship with you, our Father, because Jesus went to the cross. Amen.